You are of all people most blessed. You get two messages this morning. You've just heard one of them. Uh, you did a great job. and But even more, it was giving God glory through song. We are ever blessed that God gave us song in our hearts. I invite you to turn with me to Ephesians, the second chapter. We'll be reading verses 19 through 22. Ephesians, the second chapter, verses 19 through 22. <clears throat> Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. In him... In him you are being, <clears throat> well, turn two pages at the same time, that doesn't work. In him you are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. May God bless the reading of his word. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Father, open our hearts and our minds now to your word as we reflect together upon the message that you have for us, because this we pray in the name of Christ. Amen. You know, in a real sense, the people of God and the house of God, or the house of the Lord, is inseparable. The Bible describes the people of God as being a house of the Lord. <clears throat> The house of the Lord is described as a spiritual structure. Paul puts it like this. We are being built together with all of the others into a place where God lives through His Spirit. On another occasion, Paul reminds us, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. You see, it is almost a paradox the people of, of God are described as the house of the Lord. And yet, on the other hand, the people of God are described as a house that have been built with hands. So, <clears throat> built with hands, you see it as a place where the people of God gather. It is a meeting place. It is this place that we're gathered in this morning. The book of Exodus gives instruction to the builders. When Moses finished building the house built with hands, it was a tent. You see, other times the house that God had built was a temple, remember, Mo, uh, Solomon uh, in his reign. Sometimes the people of God are referred to as the house of the Lord. At other times, the house of the Lord may be a tent, or it may be a cathedral, or it may be in someone's home, or it may be a stable where a child is born. It may be a school, but always the house of the Lord is a place where the Spirit of God dwells amongst us. You see, there's a story of a people and of a family and of a home. In the year of 1944, I was eight years old, living with my mother, my sister, my older brother, my dad had died when I was scarcely two years old. My brother had graduated from high school that spring. And my <clears throat> mother was determined that he would have a high school education. 
or, or at least one college, one year of college education. Money was scarce. The plan that my mother had, and she always had a plan. I didn't always agree with those plans. I respect them more today, I guess, than ever. But mother had a plan, and she and John would go to Evansville that summer, Evansville, Indiana, that summer, and get a job and work. And that money would supplement the money that had been laid aside for his education. But there was a problem. And the problem was my sister and me. What would they do with us? Well, there was family. Anne, my older sister, would be staying with my uncle and aunt, who lived just a short distance from the home place. She was older than I was, and uh, therefore the reasoning was she would be close by and she could keep the yard mowed at the house. That sounded like a winner to me. I would be staying with my grandmother and granddad. You know, actually, mother had things reversed. I learned several years later, as I was talking to my sister, that she really wanted to stay with my grandparents that year, uh, that summer. I wanted to stay with my uncle and aunt. But I, because my uncle was always doing these neat things, and he would take me with him. He was the community carpenter, and often he would take me with him, and I would carpenter along with him. <clears throat> you see, not only that, I would be close by the home. There was nobody there, but it was a comfort to see the house. You see, sometimes the house that we call home has to defer to the needs of the family. The needs of the family come first. Likewise, the house of the Lord was created to serve the needs of God's people. As the people of God, we need a house of the Lord. We need a meeting place such as we have this morning, a place to meet with one another in the name of the Lord, but more important, a place where the Lord may come in all of His glory and visit with us. The purpose of the house of the Lord is to continually remind us of the presence of God, reminding us that He is our God and we are His people. The people of God must realize the role of the house of the Lord. You see, first of all, the role of the house of the Lord is to help fulfill the needs of God's people. Perhaps that's the reason that the first house <clears throat> that the Lord provided His people was a tent. Remember the children of Israel, fresh out of captivity, out of slavery. They would spend the next 40 years wandering in the wilderness. They didn't need a permanent structure. They needed a tent. They needed a tabernacle that they would carry with them. It would be placed in the center of the camp and it would remind us, remind them of God and His presence with them in all of their activity. King Solomon, in his reign, built the temple, built it in Jerusalem, in a very prominent place. Later, the synagogue would be placed in the villages, also in a very prominent place. Sometimes the house of the Lord would be in a home, such as it was with Aquila and Priscilla. Above all, the role of the house of the, of the Lord, of the house of God, was to bring glory to God by bringing us into His presence. As the people of God, we need to recognize the threats that face the building of God, the house of God. 2008, eight years ago, right after Christmas, my home church burned. It burned to the ground. But you know, 
fire and storm are not the greatest threat to the church, to the building, to the house of the Lord. The greatest threat is when we begin to worship the house instead of God. Sometimes we become so attached to the house of the Lord that the glory of the Lord is lost and it is replaced by the glory of the building. We're in trouble. In a real sense, the house of the Lord is subservient to God's people, to the family of God. The people have to come first. My cousin, about my age, also spent the summer with my grandparents. Actually, it was a rather exciting summer. <coughs> the thing that we looked forward to <coughs> was about once a week, my grandmother would take us to the general store. Now, grandmother would put some eggs in a basket, usually a dozen. And they would be divided between my cousin and I, and that was our spending money. Each egg was worth two and a half cents a piece. Two eggs was a nickel. I look forward to those trips to the store, but there was a downside. You see, my home was right next door to that general store. And when I would see my home, sometimes I'd get homesick. I'd feel lonely inside. But the house also reminded me that there was family. And someday that family would be gathered together again. See, the house of the Lord reminds us that we are God's people. We are God's family. The house of the Lord reminds this community that there is a family of God that dwells there. As people pass the road, drive the road, and look at the building, they realize that there, are, there is a family of God in this community. We're responsible to reflect the family values of our Lord. The house of the Lord reminds us that we are the people of God. We are the family of God. Paul reminds us that we are a family with a foundation. We are a family with a cornerstone. We are a family with a history. You are built upon the foundation laid by the apostles and the prophets. The cornerstone being Christ Jesus himself. He is the one who holds the building together and makes it to grow into a sacred temple, so Paul tells us. The other Sunday when I left my truck keys in the truck and locked the truck and had to call my wife to come and get me or to come and bring the, car, uh, the truck keys, rather humiliating call, uh, <coughs> While I was waiting, I wandered around out in the cemetery there, and I came to the, to the grave of Fremont Young. Fremont Young used to attend the New Hope Church up in the area, the, the Oak Ridge area there, uh, on Bear Creek Road. Probably the second, maybe the third Cumberland Presbyterian Church that, came, that was organized in East Tennessee. Fremont Young attended that church, and he desperately wanted a church in his own community. Today's Young's Chapel. You see, he wanted the people of God. He wanted a house of the Lord for the people of God in his community. The house of the Lord reminds us that the people of God need a bond that binds us together. Now, the house of the Lord does not bind us together. In fact, the house of the Lord sometimes need to be bound together. Now, true enough, sometimes in a building program or whatever, the house of the Lord, you know, uh, becomes the focal point of unity. The house of the Lord, the building, that house made with hands is not what binds us together. 
It is Christ that binds us together. At a community luncheon uh, several years ago, Roy Miller was sitting at the table with me and he was reflecting on the time that the Mary had a, at a church uh, underwent some renovation. Roy worked for the company that got the contract for the renovation. In fact, Roy was appointed, uh, they was given the responsibility of being the foreman of the crew that came out to do the renovation. Uh, the visible part of that renovation was when they put the front porch on Marietta Church back in the 70s. But that wasn't the reason for the renovation. The reason for the renovation was that the bell in the belfry was getting tired and it was setting down. And as it set down, it pushed the front of the building out. The front of the building had to be torn out, new framing put in, all of new weatherboarding. But the thing that Roy really remembered was they needed something to tie the back of the church to the front of the church so the front of the church wouldn't run down the hill. And Roy found the solution. <coughs> he told his boss, the contractor, that they needed metal bands all the way around in the church. And that wasn't figured in the deal. And the contractor was concerned, well, where can you get metal bands, Roy? And how much are they going to cost? <clears throat> that was the bottom line. Roy says, I can get them and they won't cost you a thing. Roy went up to Byington to the railroad track where they unloaded freight there and he had already seen those bands. Evidently they'd cut them off and just threw them aside after they unloaded a load from one of the flat cars. Roy brought the bands down, he put them around, tied the church together. You see, sometimes the church building itself needs bound together and we dare not look to ourselves to bind it together. We look to the Lord. The Lord's house, the Lord's family must be bound together through Jesus Christ. Christ is the bond that binds the people of God together. My grandparents had raised six children. They had watched them leave home. They knew something about raising kids. My grandfather realized that the best way to combat homesickness was to stay busy, to install a sense of responsibility and accomplishment. I'm not aware that my grandfather ever took a course of psychology in his life, but he sure knew how to apply it. One day when he and I were standing out beside the barn, looking out over the field of sprouts, 10 acres of sprouts, He turned to me and he said, Don, I really need that field of sprouts cut. I said, would you cut them for me? I'll give you a dollar. He could have cut that field of sprouts with a mowing machine in about two hours. But anyway, <coughs> the field, 10 acres, extended on down from just below the house, on down by the cattle barn, by the tobacco barn, over the hill slightly, we called it the ridge field, and then dropped off down toward the river. He did two things. First of all, he promised a reward. Have you ever figured out just how many eggs it would take at two, two and a half cents a piece to make a dollar? Bet you haven't figured that lately. It would take 40 eggs. 40 eggs. I would never get that many eggs off my grandmother all summer. A whole dollar. I started on that field of sprouts with vengeance. Each day my grandfather would sharpen the gooseneck hoe. Things went well. Actually, I, I come to enjoy it. And then there came the day that the house was no longer in sight. I had dropped over the hill. Trips back to the house to get a drink of water became very frequent. I became waterlogged. One day, my grandmother appeared out there with me. 
She had her quilt and she had her bag for sewing supplies. And she said, I thought this would be a good place to do my sewing today. And she spread out her quilt and she sat down and she began to do her sewing. It made all of the difference in the world. Her presence made all of the difference in the world. You see, the house of the Lord is a witness to the presence of God in this community. And this house of the Lord can make all of the difference in the world to this community because it reminds us, it reflects the presence of God with us. The house of the Lord is a symbol that God must be the center of our lives for the Israelite, the temple. The tabernacle was located in the very central part of the camp. The house of the Lord is a witness to what is holy. It reminds us that it is not the building, but it is God who is holy. The house of the Lord is the symbol of God amongst us. The book of Revelation puts it very fitly. I heard a loud voice speaking out of heaven from the throne. Now God's home is with mankind. He will live with them and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and he will be their God. I remember the day I finished the field of sprouts. Grandfather was standing by the corner of the barn where it all started. I came with hoe in hand. I could tell that my grandfather was pleased, and that pleased me. (coughs) He handed me a dollar bill, and he said, you did a good job. And then he added, I didn't really think you'd finish it. I was pleased that I had completed the task because I felt it pleased him. But there was an even greater task that was completed, a family task. My brother would go to college. My mother and my sister had come home. The tabernacle was finished. The writer in Exodus describes the completion of the tabernacle with these simple words. So Moses finished the work. What a tremendous message. Only five words, but what a message. But you know, as far as a person could do God's work, Moses had done it. But God's grace, it was by God's grace that the work was completed. But there still needed to be the seal of God. The field of sprouts was finished, but there still needed to be that seal of completion that my grandfather gave me. Exodus book puts it like this. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Let us pray that the glory of the Lord will fill this house of the Lord with God's glory. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Father, you have been good to us. You have blessed us. You have watched over us, and we praise you for it. May we be a symbol of your presence in this community. For this we pray in the name of Christ. Amen.